So finally we come to the uh, quantum mechanical description of something that's clearly chemical, namely the hydrogen atom, the first element in the periodic table. Now let's see what we can say uh, using quantum mechanics about that. First we're going to recognize that this is a system called a central force problem, that's what the physicists call it. What does that mean? Well we have the positively charged nucleus and we have the electron up here and it's separated by some distance here. The electron can also move around, around uh, say, a surface of a sphere uh, for a given value of this distance r. Well, what this means is that the force the, um, between these two particles, which we said was the Coulombic force, the attraction of opposite charges, depends only on the distance between these two and doesn't depend upon the angle, just on the distance. That's called a central force that the force vector goes from one center out or from uh, into that one center. It's called the central force problem. What that means is that we really, uh, although it may not appear that at first, uh, it, we really should use spherical coordinates because this is a spherically symmetric problem. The force only depends on this distance between the two particles and then the angles uh, can be described by something else. So it will lead to a separation of variables and we can solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. So let's go ahead and use spherical coordinates. Now spherical coordinates were first introduced when we talked about particle on a sphere. Uh, let's introduce them again here just to review. This is the x direction, this is the y, and this is the z. These are Cartesian coordinates and what we want to do is describe a vector in three dimensions as uh, this of course this vector will have a position x, y, and z away from the origin so that's Cartesian coordinates but let's try to describe this in terms of spherical coordinates. So if we look at the angle, we're going to label this angle between the z-axis and the vector as theta. Then we're going to project this down onto the xy plane. So now we have this vector out here and this then would be described by some position x and y and if we draw this vector out here we're going to from this angle we're going to call that phi and the final coordinate here is r so that's how you specify a point in space using spherical coordinates r theta and phi distance from the origin distance from the x and the distance around or sorry and and angle with respect to the z-axis and then angle with respect to the x-axis going around the z-axis so that's how we're going to do spherical coordinates and as we said before we're going to assume that the nuclei are stationary that's the born oppenheimer approximation by doing that approximation we've uh, said the coordinates of the um, proton here if this is stationary fixed in space then we only have to look at the uh, coordinates of the electron. So essentially we eliminate a whole set of coordinates with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. The nucleus is stationary. And we justified that assumption uh, by or that approximation by saying the uh, proton is much more massive than the electron. So as electron, that light particle is moving all around in space, the proton just sort of sits there more or less. It's about 1800 times as heavy as the electron, so probably a pretty good approximation. All right, so using spherical coordinates and with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, we can then uh, write the um, Hamiltonian here in terms of spherical coordinates. All right, so remember to do the Hamiltonian, you take h, which we said was L squared, over 2i plus the potential here, that was e squared, over uh, epsilon naught. And as I look at this, I'm carrying around a 4 pi. That depends on what units you're using. So let me put a 4 pi uh, epsilon naught there. And so if you looked at the classical description, I got rid of that 4 pi. So it depends on what sort of electrostatic units you are. 4 pi epsilon r, where this is the distance 
between uh, the electron and the proton. Okay. Well, to now go to quantum mechanics, we replace the momentum with an operator. And let me just write that as equal to h bar squared over 2i. We're using i because we have a particle has angular momentum. And this is the moment of inertia. I'm going to simply write this as del squared plus e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. All right, so what is del squared? Well, del, which is given, d, called del, d-e-l, that is defined as um, derivatives with respect to spatial coordinates. All right. So depending on our coordinate system, we can replace del squared by appropriate uh, substitution. For example, in the Cartesian coordinate system, del squared would be the second derivative with respect to x, second derivative plus the second derivative with respect to y, plus the second derivative with respect to z. In spherical coordinates, uh, del squared is uh, this term in here. So you see why sometimes it's useful <laughs> to write uh, this in terms of del. And del is independent of or del squared. Del squared is independent when you write it this way, independent of the coordinate system, but then when you translate to a particular coordinate system, you get something like that. All right, so that looks pretty complicated, and you're probably saying, well, why did we uh, <laughs> complicate the uh, Hamiltonian? Why didn't we just have second derivative with respect to Cartesian coordinates? Well, it's because of this symmetry here. The solution to the Schrodinger equation is much more simple, even though you have to introduce the more complicated uh, uh, Hamiltonian operator in terms of spherical coordinates. All right, so you can take my word for it, or if you don't, uh, go ahead and try to solve the Schrodinger equation using that simplified form of the Hamiltonian, and you'll find pretty soon that it's almost impossible because um, spherical coordinates are the way to go. Okay, so that's it. Now uh, let's try to solve this equation.